Welcome to Natural Habitat Adventures Daily Dose of Nature. Today's topic, photography tips for Churchill's Bears, Belugas, and Aurora, presented by NatHab Expedition Leader, Julia Ciampini. I'm your host, Rob Mess. Thank you all so much for being here with us today. Over to you, Julia. Thank you so much, Rob, and thank you everyone for joining me today. Uh, I'm delighted to share a subject matter that I love so deeply, uh, and that's photography, in a place that I have come to really, really appreciate and adore. Um, unfortunately, I don't have presenter notes today, so we are gonna go uh, play by play, so please be patient with me. Uh, today, I'm gonna take you on a journey through Churchill, first introducing the town itself, uh, and then I'd like to talk about how to prepare for a photographic trip. I'll take you on a visual tour of Churchill itself through some of my pictures. And with those pictures, I'm gonna share some photography tips along the way. And at the end of this presentation, we'll have some time for a Q&A. Uh, I really look forward to hearing the questions that you have about these trips. To introduce myself, I am a photographer, a teacher, and a guide. Um, more than anything, though, I'm a person who deeply loves and appreciates nature. I've guided in 25 countries, um, and I have a Bachelor of Science in um, Biological Sciences, a Master's of uh, Arts, Fine Arts in Documentary Photography, and also a Master's of Science in Education. Um, I'm also a certified teacher. So I love to guide, I love to teach, and I love to teach photography. It's all a wonderful, it's been a wonderful career for me. Um, I am a, a photographer by trade. For 15 years, I worked as a wedding and portrait photographer, uh, but also as much as I possibly could, did wildlife and nature photography. And I've also done about 10 very, very large road trips across Canada. The first was 19,000 kilometers in 21 days uh, and took me all the way north to Taktayaptak, uh, where I got to dip my, my toes in the Arctic Ocean. It was an incredible, incredible experience. Um, I am Canadian um, by birth. I live in Toronto and I love this country. So you will most often find me curled up in a ball taking pictures and through all the years of photography and through all the journeys that I've done, uh, I've made a lot of photographic errors and I've learned a lot through those errors. I've, I've, that's how you learn. You, you practice, you make mistakes, and you figure out ways to improve in each case. So I am delighted to work with NatHab. Uh, I guide in all of their Churchill programs, their summer programs, their uh, fall programs, and their Northern Light programs. Um, and it's, it's beautiful to see this town in different stages. Um, so I wanted to share, start by sharing my very first polar bear experience. Uh, it was during a summer program and we had just all piled into our polar rover, beautiful vehicle, and we were just about to go onto the tundra. Uh, there is a particular spot called Halfway Point where we stopped for dinner. And this was our view of the bay, absolutely stunning view. And in the distance, our driver said he spotted a log. This was a little further than this, but a, a small white log and no way did it look like a bear. And he said, for sure that's a bear. Let's stay quiet, let's watch. Let's see if it, it will come towards us. And this bear was a little bit curious and it came towards us on land. And as we watched quietly and patiently, it left the rocks or sorry, excuse me, it left the water and hopped onto the rocks. This isn't as strong of a picture because of the lower contrast between the bear and the sand behind it. But when he stepped behind the rocks, I could start to shoot. I could start to really see the bear. It stood out amongst the rocks and the bear got closer and closer, very curious to us. It was an amazing experience and I looked around me and there were, uh, a woman behind me had tears in her eyes and everyone was gripping their seats, excited to see what's happening. And, you know, silently, patiently waiting to see if the bear would come closer. And he did, he came to sniff a log 
and started to roll around and play. And I could feel my heart beating in my chest. This is really a, a magical experience, unlike anything in the world. And the bear got extraordinarily close to us. Uh, so for a first bear experience, this was what I experienced. And from then on, uh, I knew I, I had to, I had to do this more often. I had to do this. I had to learn more. This was it. Um, so I wanted to take you uh, through the town of Churchill and have you see what I see when I'm shooting there and kind of get to know the place a little bit better. So if you are not familiar with Canada, Churchill is located in Manitoba, one of our central provinces, and it's located north in Manitoba. It's just in the Hudson Bay, and it's a very unique location because the Churchill River uh, essentially meets the bay. So you have fresh water meeting ocean water. And in that area near Churchill, the ice will freeze first in, in everywhere. That's the first place the ice will freeze over. And the bears intuitively know and understand this. And the bears want the ice in late fall. And the reason they want the ice is so that they can hunt their preferred meal, which is ring seal. Ring seals are blubbery, fat little animals that polar bears can gorge on and gain a lot of calories for their long uh, fasting periods. So Churchill is a very unique location. Ice freeze is here first. Polar bears understand this. When you come to a Churchill program, we start our programs in Winnipeg, and then we take a charter plane all the way up to Churchill. Um, and Churchill is a pretty unique town because it, it is only accessible by air or train. And this is kind of an overview of uh, Churchill. When you land on the plane, you land at the airport point, uh, pointed here with the yellow arrow, and then we'll drive towards the town itself. And you can see based on this map how small the town is. It's, it's a few streets, you know, it's not a big place. This is it from above in the summertime. You see the estuary on the left and the bay on the right. You can see that biggest building in the distance, that's our port. And then this is the bulk of the town. It's a very quaint, small, small town. The population is about 800 people. And I believe there's, uh, I think it was 860 bears in the Hudson Bay population. So this is our town in the winter. Quite a, quite a stark place. Beautiful, beautiful, interesting place, unlike anywhere you've ever been in the world. Uh, so it's an interesting place as well because people coexist with polar bears and uh, when you go there you'll be given a map of an area of the town where you can walk um, during the day because these areas are monitors and then there are areas of the town where you're not recommended to walk at all without your expedition leader because it's unsafe and uh, you know, keeping in touch with the local news, last week there was a bear that came through town as children were waiting for the bus, and so they had to run back into, into safety. So really interestingly about Churchill, uh, the doors of every car are left open just in case someone has to sneak into a car if there is a bear there, and you are not allowed to name your dog Bear because saying, hey bear, hey bear, could be quite a dangerous thing. So you signed up for a Churchill trip and you're wondering what to pack or what you need to bring. I'm gonna really focus in on the photography part of this. Um, typically guests will pack a carry-on bag and a check luggage. And if you're a photographer, you'll also have a camera bag. So in your carry-on bag, you'll have your boots, your parka, hat, gloves, lots of extra layers for the, or an extra layer for that day wallet, passport, medication. Uh, NatHab does a great job at um, providing water bottles and mugs for hot drinks. These are um, reusable mugs, so we're eliminating plastics. And you also have your camera, your binoculars, and any laptop or tech that you might bring. That will all go on your carry-on. And in your check luggage, you'll wanna put your clothing, your personal items. Uh, keeping tags, uh, keeping your luggage tagged is also very important. Now on to the camera equipment, my favorite part. Um, NatHab offers the service of valet. So it's a carry-on piece of uh, a carry-on piece of bag that you can 
uh, hand to the valet, they keep it above the plane. It's kept in a very safe place, but you don't have to then deal with it. So in your camera bag, you'd likely pack a camera body, a wide angle lens, telephoto lens, lots and lots of extra batteries, extra chargers, and camera cards. I will say extra batteries are a great idea, especially in the winter time, where your batteries can be very quickly drained by the cold weather. And so having a few chargers and more batteries than you think you need is a very good idea. Uh, you'll want UV filters on every single lens you have. Uh, and if you're in northern light season, a tripod is a must. I also tend to have cleaning cloths and rain protection for my camera bag, for myself and for my camera. And sometimes I find that in a hotel room, there might not be enough power plugs. So I'll bring a power bar because I often have to keep my telephone, my camera gear, my laptop and all those pieces of equipment charged. So I mentioned having a UV filter on all your lenses. If you don't have one of these on your camera lens, it is very, very important to get them. They're $60 to $80 depending on the size of the lens. Um, and I have dropped a few lenses in my life and it, it was only the UV filter that saved the lens. So better to break a UV filter that's cheap compared to a $2,000, $3,000 lens. Um, and I, from personal experience, this has saved about five lenses. I don't, I don't want to admit this, but about five lenses. So uh, it also protects your camera from any sand, dirt, dust, or mud. Uh, it's great for weatherproofing. And if you scratch the top of your lens itself, instead of scratching your expensive lens, you're just scratching this UV filter that you can easily replace. Uh, the downside to this is it is um, very, very, very slightly hazy and it might put a bluish tint, but it's so um, negligible compared to what it does. So to me, this is an absolutely essential piece of gear. Um, I mentioned, sorry, I mentioned a, a camera, a rain protector for your camera bag. I bought one of these on Amazon. It's a small little rain protector that folds up very easily. And if it starts raining, I'll whip this out of my bag and I'll just put it around my bag. It's just an added layer of protection. It's quite cheap. I think it was about $10. And I'll always have a few of these in, in my bag just to very quickly, you know, I can even wrap it around my camera if I'm out and about. And it's just that one extra layer of protection above the dry sacks that I usually would bring. Uh, so if you're a photographer um, and you are photographing in cold areas like Churchill, you might want to consider fingerless gloves. And the idea is it's just one um, a glove that allows your thumb and your index finger to be free so you can shoot and then you can cover it when it gets cold. Uh, I bought a pair recently. It's very hard to find women's sizes and quite small, but I found a brand that has very small ones. And interestingly enough, they have a little camera card pocket that you can put an extra camera card in for easy access there. Great brand until you forget that you've put a camera card in there and then are searching everywhere for it. So that's the one downfall there. The other piece of advice I have in terms of packing your camera gear is definitely get a camera case. Uh, one with the carabiner is quite nice because you can put it in the same spot every time you go. And from my days of shooting weddings, a tip that I have is as you shoot with your card, once the card is filled, turn it around so it's now facing the back. And that way you know not to grab that card that one's filled and you can grab a new formatted one so definitely a nice little tip to keep you uh quick in the field and keep you well organized when you're back in your hotel room downloading your pictures you easily know this is the one that you shot on and these are empty ones still ready to go these are great also because they can be water proof and damage resistant. So I definitely invest in something like this if you don't already have it. I used to have cloth ones, but I do find the harder, harder surface provides more protection. And unfortunately, camera cards are known to fail on occasion. I will also always bring a little um, fanny pack. And in that fanny pack, I'll put those essential things. I'll put extra batteries, I'll put my camera card case, hand warmers to keep my hands warm, little cleaning cloths for my camera lens, and that quick bag that I put over my 
camera and most importantly snacks because you need to keep yourself well fed when you're taking pictures and on a trip final items that i do tend to like to bring for photography uh, i'll always bring pen and a note pad so i can write notes on the places that i'm shooting any particular things that i'm learning that are interesting uh, that can help me tell the story of a place or add more details maybe for captions or um, blogs or those kind of storytelling details i always back up my camera my photos on a hard drive the night i shoot um, in addition to keeping my images on a card until I'm home. So I have it in two places. I have it on the card still and on the hard drive. I bring a USB stick that has both USB-C and USB-A. That way, if anyone needs to give me files, I can easily hand them that stick and they can transfer things to me. I'll always have my laptop. And for whatever reason, carabiners tend to be very, very well used. Um, to hook gear to you or to have them. I always like to have a carabiner or two on a, on a trip. The other really great piece of gear that I personally love is to have a, a GPS unit that attaches to the top of your camera to your hot shoe. Uh, and the idea is that this GPS unit will embed GPS data, lat latitude and longitude onto every single file that you take. And then if you edit your photos in Lightroom later, you can see the exact pinpoint place where you've taken the picture. And this can be back if you want to go back to a spot that's a hot spot for wildlife, or if you ever want to communicate details about location, maybe years later, where did I, where did I see this amazing thing and how can I get back there? Um, so this is a little interesting feature. I believe your phone cameras, your cell phone cameras will do this naturally. It has the GPS in, internally, but for a lot of the Pro Series uh, DSLRs or mirrorless cameras, that's something that you need to do yourself. Um, and one other piece of gear that I always recommend guests to have is binoculars. Uh, here's our beautiful guide, Judy, uh, having a pair of binoculars around her neck. It is a great thing to see distant wildlife and not all wildlife will come uh, too close to us. So to have binoculars to see details of wildlife is a really, really great thing. So guests will often come with a variety of cameras. You'll have cell phone users, you'll have um, intermediary cameras, you'll have pro pro cameras, and that what you bring all depends on what you want to do for your trip and all are phenomenal. You know, the cell phone is such a great camera nowadays because you can instantly have it anywhere you go and take really intimate, more personal photographs of, of your personal experience. Um, and then obviously the DSLRs and mirrorless cameras, the quality is unbeatable. Uh, to be able to interchange lenses and, and get a, a whole field of photography there is just is remarkable. So my personal bag, um, I shoot with a Canon R5. I tend to like to bring a range of lenses to any, any trip. I like to have a wide lens, uh, especially for northern lights, but anytime I'm in um, a situation where I'd like to show context or get some wide perspective, landscapes, internal, internal places inside buildings, a uh, wide lens will be great. Um, my favorite lenses do tend to be the longer lenses. I like the intimate perspective. I like how they compress the scenes. So I will also bring uh, 28 to 70, 70 to 200, uh, 150 to 500 for those more distant wildlife. And on my next program, I'm going to be testing out an 800 millimeter lens to see how I like uh, how it works. There are the occasional uh, fox or wildlife that stay quite far, and I'm curious to know how that will work in the situation in Churchill. Again, lots of batteries, lots of chargers, lots of camera cards, all formatted and all ready to go. And that's that's my basic kit. Uh, I do love the Pelican case. It's not what I use. I'm hoping maybe this Christmas it is what I'm going to end up using. But the Pelican case is a fantastic way to transport gear, fits in the overhead compartments, and you can get a little attachment where you can organize all your cords and your accessories um, in clear pouches with labels. And also as a final little thing about organ organizing your gear, 
I have seen some photographers, and I love this detail, uh, where they'll take a little label maker sticker and they'll put the focal length of their lens on the top and the bottom of their lens. So if their gear is sitting up on their bag, they can so easily reach for what they need. Uh, it's just another little organizational tip. Um, so I'll give you some views into what wildlife looks like in Churchill. This is maybe from a distance. These are maybe the more difficult views that you're going to encounter. Uh, and we'll play a game. It's a little less interactive than I hoped it would be. But um, looking for wildlife takes, it's an active thing. You need to actively be searching for animals that are great at camouflaging in their environment. So in this scene, you see a bear in the left-hand side on the rocks, very small shape of a bear. So when you're scanning the environment, looking out for any kind of movement, any kind of animal shapes, those round billowing, especially the bears, that like round, round shape. Uh, strangely enough, you're looking for ears, um, different colors. I don't know if you can see it in this screen, but there is an Arctic fox here so beautifully camouflaged looking exactly like a rock and that is in um, kind of the lower third and uh, your right side so coming a little bit closer to it you see it curled up like a little rock with its head there so sometimes wildlife can be challenging to spot um, and it really helps to have every single person on the rover searching for wildlife. I'll give a couple more examples of the challenge that you might encounter. So in the willows here on the um, more of the, right, the left side, you see a bear in the, the distance right near the water. And you can see its ear there. And I'll just jump ahead to, uh, let's say, so on this picture here, you will see midway through to your left side on the, um, the black area, there's a bear lying down. So bears can be so well camouflaged in the environment itself. Uh, so having your eyes opened and looking is a great thing. And this is one reason also that uh, we don't have people just leave their vehicle and kind of explore near the beaches and explore near the area. It's because it's so it can be so hard to find wildlife uh, in in the scene. So there's actually two bear in these pictures. There's one near the rock in the water and then one resting in the willows in the foreground to the left. So they can be quite, quite challenging. Um, so our hope always when we go is that we get this close up, wonderful, intimate interaction with wildlife. Um, but I will say uh, the expectations need to be um, reasonable and you're not going to a zoo. Uh, bears have quite a territory to be able to wander and they're not just sitting there waiting for us to visit them. Uh, so when you also do photography, uh, your hope is always that every single shot is going to be the best shot in the world, but it's it's often not like that. You often get a few gems within a day of shooting, and those gems are are well worth it. Uh, but having realistic expectations, I think, is quite important. And so we all seek this experience where the bear, you know, is very close to the the ro uh, the polar rover, or maybe comes close to us. It's a wonderful feeling. It's a wonderful experience, uh, but sometimes the the animals are further away but i will say as a photographer even when the animals are further away this is a beautiful opportunity to get contextual shots and to get environmental shots that show you this environment that they live in and show you the the world that they're grappling with and so you see a sleeping polar bear here on the left and then a male snowy owl here on the right in the distance in the rocks so you have everyone, you have all the guides, the polar rovers, bus drivers, all the staff, everyone conspiring to make this trip the best possible for you. And so they're always on the lookout for animals. We have radios and we're all communicating. If there is a sighting, if there is anything great, uh, we will do our best to make that happen. We want this to be incredible for you. Uh, so this 
I bring this up as an example. Uh, our bus driver, Chris, on my last trip, got a call from his cousin who said, there's a red fox in this particular area. Why don't you guys go look? And we did. And we happened to see this fox jumping and feeding. And it was just an incredible moment. It stayed with us for a few moments. Uh, but to see this fox do its thing. And this was taken, uh, shot through tinted glass of a bus. Um, and just in that key moment. So everyone, everyone is conspiring to, to make this trip wonderful for you. So I want to take you on a little tour of Churchill through the seasons and sprinkle in some photo tips with that. And Churchill, as I said before, is this really unique area uh, where people coexist with bears. And the town itself has a few different areas, but as you drive through in the morning, um, I think the town is is absolutely beautiful. And so we'll, we're, we're now entering the town itself. Um, early morning light and sunset are the most beautiful time to shoot. Uh, the quality of light makes everything so much more interesting. But as we enter the, the town, you'll start to see um, a, a town that is very much a town built around polar bears. And so you see evidence of bears everywhere you go in the little uh, house signs or on the garbage cans itself. And there are so many things to photograph within the town itself, separate from the wildlife and separate from all the other interesting things you'll see. Um, and as you get to know Churchill, you'll see some of these beautiful things and uh, you'll see artists uh, coming together to create incredible, incredible murals um, throughout town. There's quite a few of them. And unfortunately, in Churchill's history, there was a point in time recently where the train stopped running. And so, as I said before, you could only access Churchill through train or plane. And with the train not running, it made it quite challenging for people in Churchill to get some of the essential things that they needed. So that drove up prices and it made for a very difficult time for the people in Churchill. And there was uh, some artists that came together from all over the world to create beautiful murals in the town. And so they were given old buildings or interesting structures and uh, essentially freedom to create something beautiful um, inspired by the town and they had a week to do so. And it's, there's an incredible documentary that you can watch about this. Uh, but one of the things your guides will do is take you on a tour of some of these uh, murals. And photographing them is, is really quite lovely, but what they have meant to the community and what they mean to tourists is really lovely. One other thing that you will get to do uh, in Churchill is visit the Sand Attack Museum. And so this is a museum that really celebrates the Inuit culture and the art and some of the natural history in the area. And it too can be such a delightful place to bring your camera uh, to understand a little bit more about the indigenous culture of Churchill. And in this display, there's um, some stories and some interesting pieces to look out for. And I've been many, many, many times, and every single time I go to this museum, it's, a, it's small with a beautiful gift shop, but a small place. I see more and more new things. And I think that's key with photography is um, just having fresh, open eyes, ready to see what's in front of you, ready to find more things. The town itself also has a few interpretive centers. Uh, this one is Parks Canada, and it so has some interesting uh, cultural and historical details, um, some of the handicraft and the beadwork, and again, some more natural history. It's a wonderful place to visit as well, giving you more of a sense of that town and the story of the people in the town. Um, and one of the things you'll also be able to do is potentially visit Cape Mary Battery, and so that's um, a part, another Parks Canada site. And uh, with that site, because of how it is, um, the visibility isn't the greatest. You'll always have bear guards there. And bear guards are people that kind of stand watch and look for the environment, look at the environment around and assess uh, if there's a, a bear in the area and, and how to proceed safely. So you see the bear guard here standing on uh, the battery um, and usually with this kind of experience you'll get an interpretive guide who will tell you a lot of the historical stories. Another thing that you get to do on the Churchill programs that is quite unique and really lovely, you get to do it in winter and in summer and in fall, 
is uh, do a dog sledding experience at Wapask Adventures. And Wapask um, is white bear in Cree, and it is a Métis owned dog sledding uh, company. And I'll kind of take you through. So we, we come on the bus, we get to this community, you'll see a beautiful mural on the side of the, the wall there. And uh, you'll meet here, this is uh, Wyatt Daly, the son of Dave Daly, who is the owner of the company. And they'll take you on a tour of the grounds. And uh, you'll meet Dave Daly, uh, self-proclaimed self big dog. He's a character full of stories. He's done some really incredible dog sledding runs and he's quite a pillar in his community. And so he'll take you into um, his, uh, the, the place that he's created here and share some stories with you. And then you're able to meet with the dogs and um, and hear these stories. It's really quite delightful. It's heated by fire and uh, there's a lot of really interesting artifacts on the wall in the area, in the, in the place itself. Um, and then once you're done that presentation, typically you'll come out and if weather is appropriate, you'll get a chance to uh, go on a dog cart one mile ride with the dogs, um, either in small groups or large groups, very weather dependent, uh, but to feel the energy of the dogs and their excitement to, to pull you around is really an incredible experience. It's, it's unlike anything. One gets riled up and then they all get riled up and it's, it's so exciting. And so as a photographer, uh, you'll you'll have maybe your cell phone camera or your camera camera in your hands. Um, you'll in the winter time there's often a professional photographer there taking pictures and portraits of you, and you can put your email in and be sent or purchase those pictures. Um, but to have that firsthand experience from your own perspective on the cart itself is a really wonderful thing. It will help your viewers see what it's like to be you in this incredible adventure. And then afterwards, you have a chance to photograph the dogs and the dogs are beautiful and so lovely and they'll come close to you and interact with you. And I've wanted to steal some, um, but the pouch that I bring is too small for them. So I will have to try next time, but that is my goal. And these dogs are beautiful and absolutely phenomenal to, to take portraits of. Um, and just to nuzzle against, uh, each has a, its own character and it's really an absolute joy to be there. It's often uh, one of the favorite parts of this Churchill adventure is the dog sledding. And uh, if you have an opportunity, Dave Daly created the most incredible outhouse in all of the North. It is a beautiful uh, log cabin outhouse, absolutely exquisite. Do take a peek inside, it's, uh, it's amazing. Uh, so you might also have the option or you do have the option to do a helicopter tour of the area. And with the helicopter tour, it is an absolutely wonderful way to see the landscape of Churchill, to see how it differs um, every few minutes, to see the water and the land and some of the features from the sky. It's a very unique perspective. Uh, and you can take your cameras there. I will recommend don't bring your binoculars uh, as your binoculars shake and as the the helicopter vibrates, might make you feel quite sick. Uh, you can bring a wide lens and a long lens, your wide lens obviously for a wider perspective of the landscape below you, and your long lens just in case you see wildlife. If you do bring your long lens, I will recommend very fast shutter speeds, the steadiest hands you can muster, um, set your image stabilization, on, so typically a lot of lenses will have an image stabilization and you wanna turn that on, especially for this. Um, and taking video clips is, is a wonderful thing to do. Um, in the front seat of some of the helico helicopters, they have a small square uh, window that you can put your camera out of. I would not never recommend you to put your camera quite far out. It will introduce drag and it's not something you wanna do, but um, kind of peeking it out so you're not, um, so you're out of the glass in front of the lens, that is an idea as well. But definitely don't put your camera out of the camera, out of the window. And so if you do decide to do this optional um, helicopter tour, look out for polar bears, look out for moose, for caribou, red fox, arctic fox, wolves, birds, you know, there's snow geese, tundra swans. You can see in theory all of these 
from the level that the helicopter flies and it's really quite magical. Uh, so I'm going to speed up just a little bit and I'll take you through summer session, winter session and fall session. Uh, the summer is incredible because belugas will migrate in, about 3,500 belugas will migrate into that Churchill area to have their young in the warmer waters. Um, and so typically with your summer adventure, you can go out and experience the belugas on three different vessels. So you have um, a zodiac rides, a larger uh, a larger small boat ride and your kayaks and each ride will give you a different level of personalization with the beluga whales um, so one definite photography related tip i have with this is taking a moment to purchase um, your uh, a waterproof camera strap a cell phone strap that you can put around your neck making your camera very accessible for you um, but also protecting it from any water damage you'll see these two lovely ladies are donning this um, if you don't get one of these you're you're having to hold on to your camera itself if you hit a wave or a bump um, you can easily lose your camera so anytime you do any kind of water activity i think it's imperative that you have a way to keep your camera safe and attached to you. It also makes it easy to find and so you can quickly get to it in uh, a key moment. Um, so Pelican Case is a great brand that I typically trust uh, and so they make different sizes, dust, snow, water, sand, all of that. It's a great way to protect your camera and you can see in this picture that there often is splashing water so protecting your camera bag itself uh, or protecting your camera with a dry sack or bag is a great idea as well. So definitely would recommend those two things in the summer programs. Uh, do anticipate that any boat activity, there is a chance that your gear can get wet and so uh, protect it accordingly. Um, and so the Zodiac rides uh, are phenomenal. There is this moment um, when if a pod is spotted, uh, your driver will stop the zodiac and take a hydrophone and put it into the water and you can hear the sounds of the beluga whales and they're they're known as the canaries of the sea because they are so vocal and i remember distinctly being stopped in one particular area and the sounds of those beluga being different than the sounds of another area belugas and it's just a really incredible experience photographing them is hard it is very hard you'll often get um you know, just the dorsal uh, side. It's a finless dorsal side, like a um, top. Uh, you might get a fluke, you might get a blowhole, and getting an eye is so challenging. It's a lot of, you're taking more pictures than you would normally, and you're really hoping for the best. You know, burst mode, uh, fast shutter speed, um, your, your typical things to increase your chances. Some photographers will even come in with a GoPro, and a stick that extends and put that GoPro right into the water or have an attachment for the, the, the kayak itself. And the kayak is, is interesting. I would definitely not recommend bringing your mirrorless or your DSLR on the kayak itself. The, when you do have a beluga and it comes close to the boat and maybe nudges the boat or follows the boat, uh, as they sometimes do if you're excited to be paddling. Um, it can be a little bit unnerving. And so I think this is a great time for a more a waterproof camera or a cell phone in a case than a DSLR. Uh, there's a lot of opportunities to photograph birds, but as a little photo tip, look out for where the birds are, especially these incredible Arctic terns. Oftentimes, bear in the summer, if there are, will go uh, where the Arctic tern colonies are. And so seeing a few terns in the air in a particular place could be an indication that there's a bear below. And Arctic terns are formidable birds. They travel from the Arctic to Antarctica uh, in one migratory season. And over the course of the, their, their lifetime, they'll travel from the earth to the moon that distance. So incredible birds to see. So in the summer, there is a potential, you see how many Arctic terns are around the base of this image, uh, but in the summer, there is a potential to see bear as well. They tend to be a little lazy on the rocks, uh, fasting, and in particular spots. And again, uh, the whole team is trying to communicate 
to help you see these things. As a photographer, it is great, great to stay ready at all times. You never know what's gonna fly into this frame. Here are three birds just flying right on top of this zodiac. So stay ready. Um, there are so many beautiful birds in Churchill. I believe there's about 230 odd species, um, whether migrating through or overwintering in Churchill. Here are some snow geese uh, flying through. They're just, uh, it's a really incredible, place to um, see. And one thing I didn't mention earlier is that Churchill is formidable for many reasons, but one is that it is um, the center of three different ecos, eco, uh, systems. So there's the tundra, the uh, Arctic environment, and um, the boreal forest. And so these three different ecosystems each have their own wildlife particular to those ecosystems. So from this one point in Churchill, you have access to so many different types of wildlife. So um, a few different bird photography tips uh, is stay really observant to the way birds are. Um, see if you can notice particular patterns in behavior. And when you're photographing, uh, if you're struggling with birds in flight, see if you can catch them as they take off and as they land. Typically, they'll take off and land in similar patterns. And so if you can kind of get to the rhythm of that takeoff and land, you're in a better spot. Um, so here I was just observing these three eiders um, and one took off. Then the next, then by the third time, I was able to kind of get the rhythm and I was able to get this shot as they ran to take off. And you never know what kind of fun and interesting things you'll see, um, whether it's dogs on the zodiac or beautiful water. So have your camera out at all times and be, be prepared. Uh, as a great example, we saw uh, in one of the summer programs, three bears swimming in the water uh, in a place called Eskimo Point. And um, just having the camera out and ready, we we're able to snap this little shot of the bears looking at me as they left the land. Um, so I'm going to just zip on through for a moment. Um, as you go through one of the things you'll know about Churchill in the summer, there's a very, very short growing season where uh, plants can grow, where there's enough light in the day and there's enough warmth in the day where plants will go. And some of the, the plants are absolutely beautiful. And so it can be a delightful thing to see the plants and hear the stories about them. And so there's this myth about this fireweed here that when uh, the last petal comes to the top, there's only six weeks until uh, winter. And so if you get light uh, streaming behind your subject, you can really uh, highlight the shape. It's a beautiful place to, to see wildflowers and in the summer. Uh, so oftentimes, uh, also in the summer programs, we'll end the program with a fire, a fire by the beach. And the beach is an area where you do typically want a bear guard because it's an area that is maybe a little bit lower visibility and known to have bears. So we'll have a bear guard with us and he'll be there watching us. Usually there's, in our case, there was two watching our surroundings and uh, as we sit by the fire and chat and have homemade cookies. And it's this wonderful part of the summer season and a, a, a beautiful part to photograph. And so you watch the sunset uh, over this Anukshuk and uh, and see the town in a different light. So usually people come for the polar bears, but I hope that you're seeing this town is, is really incredible. The fall season, um, there are many populations of polar bears, 19, and the one that we're focused on is the Western Hudson Bay population. Looking at this map of Canada, you'll notice these are the denning sites, and we circle down to where it says WH, in that Hudson Bay, that's the Western Hudson Bay population, you'll see that there are many, many, many denning sites in this area, and they're all within this Wapusk National Park. And this is where we take our rovers, and this is where we go to spot wildlife. Um, so you wanna bring layers, what to wear. You wanna bring layers, you wanna wear your boots, your parka, hats, neck warmers, gloves, 
lots of long underwear, warm pants, sunglasses. You want to bundle up, especially if it's cold. And you do have the choice when you do this experiment to stay on the Tundra launch or to just do a, a premier adventure where you're not on the Tundra launch. And if it were up to me, I would say absolutely do the Tundra Lodge option to be able to sleep out on this very unique hotel that's situated in this Danny, like a, in this Wapusk National Park area. Uh, and to be able to, you know, look out your window and if there's northern lights, they're there and you're just looking at them through your window. Or if there's a polar bear um, in the area, you can just wake up. And the sun sets and rises are beautiful. So the rovers are fascinating. There's a window seat for absolutely everyone. Uh, it is a great way to experience the tundra. There's toilets and you usually get a beautiful meal. Um, you've probably seen what they look like before but when we go to um, a polar rover we'll take a journey away from town towards the east into that area where there are more polar bears and uh, to have success in this you really do have to have that expedition mentality so being on time working as a team being kind to one another that will help set the team up for success and more than anything i think the behavior of silence if there is a possibility to view an animal is very helpful um, so the polar rovers will drive on old military roads and they do this for for a few reasons but one of them is conservation of the land the plants have such a short growing season and if the rovers just went wherever they wanted to go you're you're destroying those plants in that landscape so the rovers themselves are confined to this military road. This means that they don't chase wildlife and nor should they. That's not the way you want to view wildlife. And so what we're doing is we're traveling the, the road and going into spots where you have chances to see uh, animals. And every person will have a window to themselves and a seat beside themselves. And you're able to put your camera outside the window, but not too far. And I would always recommend watch out for long hair or dangling scarves or any uh, strings or cords that could potentially dangle. You don't want them to be um, swiped or taken. The rovers themselves have bean bags, so you can put your uh, long lenses on the bean bags. Um, but I will suggest you practice with the windows. Your guide and your drivers can absolutely help you with that. Sometimes they get stuck, but taking a few moments when you first get on the rover and practicing how to open them and close them will increase your chances of getting that key moment because you're not fiddling with the window. So you can see here how spacious the rovers are. If there is a sighting or if there is a viewing, you, you do really have a chance to see uh, what's there. And then here's a picture of the rover from a distance and a polar bear in the foreground. And you see the rover has um, a back deck viewing area. So big tip here, the doors and the windows and the bathroom doors uh, can be very loud. So do take the time to slowly close them. And um, I like to set up my area, get my batteries, get my cards, get everything I need beside me in the chair beside me put everything I don't need under my seat and make sure my way is clear so that as I move around to spot wildlife, I'm not banging and clanging around. I'm, I'm very efficient in the way that I move so that I can be as quiet as possible. And so on board every single rover, there is a scope and your guide will uh, set the scope to the wildlife so you can get a more close view. Uh, and the, the experience of the rovers is unreal. These things are amphibious and they go through both water and land uh, and your driver will um, coordinate with other drivers to find all the spots with some of the, the most beautiful wildlife. And so I, I always, um, first thing I'll do with my guests is uh, set up a system where you can communicate where the animals are. So your 12 o'clock is directly in front of you, your three o'clock is to the left, your uh, six o'clock is directly behind you and your nine's to your right. And so if you see an animal in the distance at two o'clock, you know, it's two o'clock from where I'm standing. Um, and then as you're looking, you're looking close to the vehicle, midway to the vehicle and then far from the vehicle. So you can kind of get this wonderful way to communicate. I've also, also often also photographed what I'm searching for uh, and shown people 
uh, where it is in the photo. So if there's a, a bear between two rocks, I'll, I'll verbally say it, but I'll also take a picture so I can physically show them where it is. And that's a great way to help others find what you're looking for. So bears can be quite sleepy, uh, but they can also be very curious and come close to the rovers. Um, we had a wonderful spotting last trip where a bear came and uh, just sat with us and, and came closer and then started scratching and itching and was its playful little self and then fell over and then went to sleep. And so typically they are fasting and they are trying to conserve energy. So you might find a lot of sleeping bears. Um, but luckily for us, sleeping bears are beautiful. Um, and you might also get a cute backside of the bear as it wanders away. And this is not my picture, but it is one of my absolute favorite pictures in all of uh, all of anything. And it's the sweet Arctic fox following around a polar bear. And this is a typical behavior because the polar bears like to eat the blubber of the seals, the, the fatty, calorie-rich blubber, and the little arctic fox is a small scavenger that will follow around its larger polar bear companion, hoping to get the meats of its kill. Uh, so my, my hope next trip is that I'll get to see this, but we'll, we'll see. So there's also beautiful ptarmigan with their furry feet, an arctic fox. Uh, always look for areas of contrast, so you're uh, beautiful rim light around the fox against the dark willows makes the fox stand out. Um, there's red fox in the area, wolves, caribou, and a little tip for any kind of wildlife photography, uh, getting low as possible, shooting with a shallow depth of field and a long lens to isolate your subject and emphasize your subject. If it's a shot like this that's a little bit tricky where there's blades of grass and lots of things in the foreground that your camera might really struggle to focus on, there I go to manual focus and I just very, very carefully get the focus that I like uh, with key uh, on the fact that the eye needs to be in focus. The eye is the sharpest point. Watching for the background, the light, and giving the, the wildlife or the animal a little bit of space in front, more space in front of the animal than behind. This lead room uh, gives the animal um, more of a harmonious composition. Uh, so in a case like this, um, we want to have our camera ready, a fast shutter speed. Maybe you want your burst mode, your AI server function, and eye detection. All these little things will help you increase your odds of getting these key second tiny shots. And one little rule of thumb is you want to, if you want a sharp picture, this is not for any kind of creative blur, but if you want a sharp picture, look for the focal length of your lens, which is typically written uh, as a number on the lens followed by a millimeter. And you want to set your shutter speed to at least one over that number. So for example, I'm shooting at 200 millimeters here. So at the very least, I want my camera to be set at one over 200 of a second, and that will help eliminate blur. But usually I'm bumping that up a little bit more to ensure that I get a sharp picture. And another little photography tip is you have autofocus points. Uh, it's a great idea to align an autofocus point with the eye of your subject if it's an animal. Um, so really placing that autofocus point on the eye itself will ensure that that eye is sharp. And if that eye is sharp, that connection is established. Here is an award-winning image of, um, this was the Audubon 2021 winner. Um, and the photographer has the sharpest point on the eye itself. And everything else is a creamy blur. But this, the photograph is successful because the eye is sharp. So with any kind of wildlife, patience is the biggest virtue. Uh, I think people often go on to a rover and expect, you know, there's going to be 17 different animals before 9 a.m., but it's not like that. Uh, again, it's not a zoo. You are going on an Arctic expedition and you are visiting wildlife in their natural habitat. Uh, so quick little brief thing about the winter season and then I'll tie it all up together. Uh, the winter season is a wonderful chance to see Aurora Borealis, and with Nat Hab, uh, you see it in a variety of different ways. 
there's some vehicles, some domes, the Tundra Lodge, all different places that you can potentially see the Northern Lights. And the Northern Lights, they need a particular set of activity from the sun and clear skies. And so um, in the interest of time, I'm not gonna go too deep into this, but uh, shooting with a wide angle lens, 12 millimeters to 35 millimeters, great idea. Have your aperture opened as wide as possible, for example, 2.8. This allows the camera to collect as much light as possible. You wanna slow down your shutter speed from 10 to 30 seconds, and you'll do some different tests to, to adjust as needed and your ISO you're adjusting as needed. Always shoot in RAW, it gives you more latitude in your edit, and having a headlamp, photo gloves, warming packs, patience and layers will allow you to stay out there longer and try for more shots. So with Aurora Borealis, there's a lot of trial and error that comes into this. You do want your focus to be manually focused. Some people say focus to infinity, other people say focus uh, on a bright star. The key here is that you're choosing a focus point in the distance. Your autofocus point is not that great. Um, your autofocus is not that great, so you want to manually focus. And you do want to check your LCD. You can zoom in to see if it's sharp. For stability, bring a tripod. Put, that, put a bag on that tripod in case there's wind. You might want to introduce a shutter delay of two seconds. So as you press the shutter button, you're not introducing any shake as you press the button. You press the shutter button, it waits one, two, then it takes the picture, or you can get a little cable release. Again, make sure your image stabilization is on, and you can always do a little bit of denoising in post, so reducing the noise introduced by high ISO. So with Aurora Borealis, don't forget your composition, interesting foreground elements if possible, reflections, playing with panorama. Uh, there's also the option of doing wonderful time-lapse photography and some very key uh, pieces of research that you can do to increase your odds. The wonderful thing about the Aurora Borealis trips is typically if you're on a photo trip, there's an instructor there who will give you minute-by-minute um, -minute tips with you. And it's the type of thing that, uh, because it's, it's not a wildlife where you you know, shouldn't be loud and you can talk, uh, you can kind of work together to achieve the shots that you're looking for. And in the winter, you get to go snow, uh, snowshoeing and go dog sledding, but in the, in the winter, which is a really incredible experience. So as a final few things, um, the one thing that, well, NetHab does many, many, many incredible things, but one thing that I personally love so much is the fact that they have an adventure portal, which is essentially a shared, portal where everyone can share images they've taken throughout the program. So if I took some great ones and Jimmy took some wonderful ones and uh, Suzanne took some, we can all pull our images together in a very easy way and share those photographs after the fact. It's an online gallery. Um, and as a photographer, I'll always, I will always look out to take great shots of my guests, uh, enjoying themselves, enjoying their moments. Um, I'll always look to take portraits of the people there. I think some of the people are so interesting in town and they're living in a way that is different from the way that I'm living. And so it's curious to hear their stories. Um, and as a, as a photographer, for, um, if you have that spirit of finding beauty everywhere you go, uh, you will absolutely find that beauty everywhere you go. Uh, so your guides, your drivers, everyone, everyone there is wonderful and they're, they're just, they make this experience what it is. Um, and as a final note with photography, um, we often think of failure and success as opposites. So if you have a lot of bad images and only a few good ones, you think, okay, maybe I'm not a great photographer. Uh, but sometimes you need to take those not as great images to get to that shot. It helps you refine and narrow in on the vision that you're hoping to do, whether it's taking things out of the frame that you don't need or adding elements to make it more complex and interesting. Uh, so I, I feel like every single wonderful thing in an image will take you closer to the shot that you like to take. Uh, and then as a final, final tip, it is a great thing to follow the people who are working 
as guides in areas that you're going to um, and for the reason because you get some insight into what they're seeing and how they're seeing it. So when I first started working for NatHab, I immediately started following all their Churchill guides and all their guides, all their photo guides, everyone. Um, and it's been such a rewarding, interesting experience to see their, how, how they're doing what they're doing and learning from them. So if you'd like to follow me here, you can do so on Instagram or on my website. And uh, that concludes today. Thank you so much for joining me. All right, thank you so much. Now, before we start with the question and answer session, I would like to remind everyone that you can submit your questions via the question field on your control panel. All right, let's get to some of these questions. So, <clears throat> what is the closest distance we'll be able to get to a polar bear, especially without being attacked? Oh, that's a great question. So uh, the closest I've seen, sorry, I'm going to see if I can show you a physical example. The closest I've seen uh, anyone get is on the back deck, their foot being sniffed by a polar bear, but there's a metal grate in between. So you're looking at a few centimeters there, but again, protected by the metal grate. And in, um, in an earlier picture, you see the bear hands up on a rover. So I'm trying to dig all the way back there. Uh, I should just do it this way. Um, and this, this will give you a visual of how close that close is. One second. If I can find it. Sorry, this is right here. So you can see, kind of imagine the bear was at the back wheel and you could see, um, you can see kind of how high the bear goes. So you're looking at maybe a foot or two. So definitely don't want any dangling things. Great, good to know. So do you have a favorite post-processing software that you recommend? 100% Adobe Lightroom, it is phenomenal. Great way to organize your pictures and great way to edit them. I would fully recommend Adobe Lightroom. So what if I don't have a complex camera? Is there like a basic camera that you can recommend or is an iPhone good enough? iPhone is absolutely good enough. Uh, more and more uh, I'm guiding, the more I'm seeing people only take iPhones with them. It's a great camera. Uh, the cameras are getting better and better as time goes by. And it's also the camera that you have in your pocket with you. And so I've seen a lot of people get phenomenal pictures with their iPhones, 100%. Uh, just speaking from personal experience, I've been a photographer forever, so that's the camera that I know and love the best. But for sure, an iPhone, you can get some great, great shots. Good to know. Thank you. So who are the inhabitants of the Churchill? Are they temporary workers? Are they First Nation people? Can you tell us a little bit about who they are? Oh, that's a great question. So um, generally, they're, uh, I believe the population is, um, I read the stat earlier today, but it's uh, about 50 or so percent indigenous. Uh, Inuit, Cree, and Dene are the, the indigenous populations. Um, there are, when tourist season hits, you do see some um, people come in to work the bars or work particular areas. Uh, with tourist season, myself as an example, I'll guide there and then come back home uh, to Toronto when I'm not guiding there. And then um, a, a, a variety of other Canadian populations. Yeah. Great, thank you. So how many people can go on the helicopter at one time? Am I gonna get a window seat or do I get stuck in the middle? Great question, 100% uh, you'd get a window seat. I believe it's three on a three person helicopter or five on a five person helicopter. So uh, I believe 100% every person gets a window seat, yes. Wow, that's great. Well, unfortunately, that's the last question that we do have time for today. So I'd like to throw it back to you for any closing comments you might have for us. Oh, thank you. Uh, I'm so glad you were able to join me, but I do hope you eventually can join me in Churchill to experience the incredible, incredible place that it is. Um, it, it really is unlike anywhere in the world. Uh, and I hope that through this presentation, you were able to see a little bit more of the richness. It's well beyond polar bears. Uh, it is polar bears, but it's more than just polar bears. 
Thank you so much and have a wonderful rest of your day. And thank you so much for taking the time to present for us today. And I'd also like to thank everyone who tuned in today. Now, if you are interested in information on how you can travel with us at NATHAB, please give us a call at the number on your screen, or you can send us an email at info at nathab.com. Our adventure specialists are happy to help you out. Join us tomorrow for our next Daily Dose of Nature. You can check out this week's lineup, including registration links on our website at nathab.com slash webinars. We did record today's presentation and we will have the replay available on our website soon. With that, I will conclude today's webinar. Goodbye, everybody. We'll see you next time.